Hey kids, it's Mr. Fly here, hope you're well. And welcome back to Bike News, this time for the month of July 2022. If you're interested in what's been going on in the world of motorcycles for the last month here in Blighty, then stick around and stay tuned. I've got four papers to take you through. All right, so welcome back to Bike News. Quite a, uh, a busy month it's been, as I say, four papers to take you through. And don't forget, as ever, I shall be doing some parish notices at the end of uh, Bike News as well to let you know some things that are going on uh, with the channel over the next month. So stick around for that as well. All righty, first up then, first paper, first story. Gosh, seems like a little while ago now, this one. Brits get fresh. Um, Triumph have been busy with their brushes as a, as a host of new colour schemes have been revealed. Now I mentioned this actually on my recent vlog video, but uh, I'm absolutely chuffed that uh, Triumph have come out with some of these new paint schemes. Some of these look great. There's a, this brilliant orange scheme. Uh, they've done some new graphics on some of the um, on some of the classic bikes, and uh, there's uh, the, the new orange and blue. All sorts of stuff that they've done. And I've been whinging on about Triumph colours for a while, so uh, it's great that they do seem to listen to their customers. Anyway, it says here, uh, as well as some lively um, designs on the Bonneville range, the Speed Twin 900. Uh, um, formerly called the Street Twin, that's right, that's the other big change they've done, they're calling this what was the Street Twin, uh, they're now calling the Speed Twin 900, and what was the Speed Twin, the Speed Twin 1200, makes sense actually from a marketing point of view I think, uh, a new silver scheme, and the 1200 now comes in matte orange, the, I'm not sh sure about matte colours on bikes actually, they, they look quite good, but I'm not sure about um, you know cleaning them and so on, but anyway, interested in your experience of that, if there are any things you need to look out for if you've got a matte finish on your bike. Uh, the Thruxton RS now comes in a racy green and silver setup, and the Scrambler 1200S comes in a rich red, while the Scrambler 900 is offered in a new red option and a matte khaki makeover. Now, the Scrambler 900 is what we used to call the Street Scrambler, so they've changed that as well. So, some good little uh, sort of interim changes there from Triumph, I think. So, well done, those guys. Thanks for listening to all our whinging about it. Okay, next up here, uh, Village Meat is back. Ah, yeah, this is the Cassington Bike Meat is back after three years. Uh, I think it happens once a year. I've never yet been, and it's not a million miles away from me. It's only in Oxfordshire. Uh, I must try and go next year, but I always only find out about it after the event. So if you're going next year, let me know a couple of weeks in advance and maybe I can get along. But anyway, thousands descended on the picturesque village of Cassington in Oxfordshire last week for the return of the popular bike night. Uh, the last Monday of June was the day when the BMRC Oxford members used to meet up to renew their membership, explained Cassington bike night chairman Martin Ritchie. Uh, eventually it got so big that the club couldn't run it. Uh, the villagers decided that the event was too good to let go and it raised a lot of money for local charities and brings businesses to the pub. So in 2012 the local village took over the running. Isn't this a great thing where the actual local community have decided that actually having a bike night is a good thing. Uh, so they've taken on running a bit. Brilliant. Uh, we used to have loads of bike nights around us in Oxfordshire, some even bigger than ours, uh, but they've stopped, so it feels like we have a duty to keep this one going, said uh, Richie, who's the uh, the chairman, Martin Richie. Fantastic. So, yeah, looks like a good do. If you went along, let me know if it's worth me going next year, but that looks great. Right, BSA I aim high. Bit of a bit of a British bike theme in uh, this month's bike news, I think. There's a few stories uh, in uh, about BSA that crop up over the next few papers, if I remember rightly. So, uh, first one here, BSA have announced a new UK and Ireland distributor alongside a new visitor experience. Um, Lucas Distribution have been appointed to help build a new dealer network from a new 100,000 square feet HQ near Coventry. In addition to being a distribution hub, um, the facility is also set to be home to be to become BSA's new UK home, aiming to offer something akin to Triumph's visitor experience in Hinkley. Now, I love the idea of the BSA. It looks a great bike, I've yet to ride it. Um, but it does look amazing, and some of the initial reviews that are coming out of people that rode it at the What's It Proving Ground uh, are saying that it's a great bike. Um, but it feels a little bit to me like BSA are trying to run before they can walk. They, I mean, they launched it at the NEC, didn't they, last year to great fanfare. We were all caught by surprise. It looked brilliant, and they were saying that it would be on sale in the spring. Well, here we are, late summer, and it's still not on sale. Um, so that gives you starts to set off a few alarm bells, doesn't it? Um, and then also talk about doing things like the Triumph Visitor Experience in Hinkley. Well, they haven't even got a factory here yet, so it just feels a little bit... Like they're always a bit ahead of the game. And also Lucas Distribution, I'm not sure who they are personally. I've not come across them before. I'm not even sure they've sold motorbikes before, have they? I don't know. Why do they even need distributors? Anyway, we'll see. We'll see what happens with BSA. I do wish them the best of luck because I do like the look of the bike and I cannot wait to have a ride of it. Um, but it just feels like they may have launched a bit too soon. Companies often do this, don't they? Um, but I think sometimes it's better if you just hold on and get things right from the get-go. But uh, it feels a little bit like it's now all a bit rushed um, and then, you know, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see how it goes with BSA, but um, there's a, one or two little alarm bells r ringing in my head about the sort of logistics and operation behind it, although I love very much the way the bike looks. 
Okay, next up, the new breed. The traditional track focus 600 class may be dead and buried, but the middleweight sports bike is far from gone. This is interesting, isn't it? Because um, do you remember how, mainly because of Euro um, 4 and 5, a lot of these middleweight sports bikes disappeared. Things like the Yamaha R6 became track only, and lots of other manufacturers just pulled out of that middleweight sports scene. Well, they do, we have got a few more now here. We've got the Yamaha R7, the Honda CBR650R, and the Aprilia RS660. Um, the thing that disappoints me with these is none of them are four cylinder. Um, middleweight bikes, which would have been, you know, super sport bikes, I should say, which for me um, adds them, you know, that screaming noise sort of goes, doesn't it, with a sports bike, as opposed to twins, which in the case of the R7, that's a parallel twin. Oh, sorry, the Honda is an inline four, I, I do beg your pardon. Um, and of course, the Aprilia is also a parallel twin. So for me, the Honda would probably be the one that got my vote, just based on the fact that it's got that inline four engine. Uh, let's see what the, I've not ridden any of these, by the way, which is why I don't know much about them. Let's see what, um, what MCN said. Uh, the Aprilia is our favourite. Although more expensive, it makes the most power and is dressed in more electricery than some Japanese superbikes. It also craves revs like a four-cylinder, interesting, uh, whilst also delivering dollops of low-end grunt and as a roomy riding position. Uh, for the style, performance and versati versatility, it simply cannot be beaten. Maybe this is a bike I need to ride. I know my friend uh, Dave from Wheelie Good TV, loves his RS660. Um, so yeah, maybe I need to get myself a go on one. I trust his judgment. He's got great... Uh, um, taste when it comes to other motorcycles so uh, yeah maybe I should give the Aprilia a go but they MCN rate it 10,300 for the RS660 uh, the R7's 8,400 and the Honda 8449 so the Aprilia is considerably more expensive so should be better really on that basis shouldn't it Oh, next up, old style, new tech. Now, this is a, an interesting bike. We have talked about it before on Bike News. This is the Maving. It's an electric bike. And I spoke to these guys at length but at the recent Bike Shed uh, Custom Bike Show in London a couple of months back. Um, a very interesting looking machine and, and properly British. It is built here in England, which I like. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an odd mismatch between or is that the right word? Mix mat? Anyway, you get what I mean. It's, it's a mixture of uh, high-tech electric electronics and electrics uh, together with this old school look of almost like a bicycle. Um, but I, I kind of like it. And I think as a, um, an option for urban riding, this, this could absolutely win. Also, I think the batteries are removable. So if you do live in a flat or something, you can't trail a lead to charge your bike up overnight. You can charge the, 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 the batteries up independently of the bike, which I think is a great idea. Anyway, it says here, Maving, based in Coventry, uh, was formed in 2017 as a startup with the intention of creating a retro-style British-built electric bike with swappable batteries. And that, for me, is the key. Uh, now employs 16 strong team of predominantly ex triumph engineers, and their first model, the RM1, which is this one, is ready for the market. Um, there's an overall impression that attention has been paid to the finer details. Brushed aluminium parts are lovely, you get braided brake lines, quality fasteners, neat switch gear and high standard of paint with the logo lacquered over. Yeah, I agree. When I looked at this up close at the bike shed, it just oozes quality. It doesn't feel like a machine that's built to a price and it is pretty well priced. I'll get to that in a minute. Maybe make no secret of the fact that their bike is aimed at urban riders. Let's face it, electric bikes still only really make sense, I would say, in the urban jungle, of which more later. Um, it's not fast. It has a top speed just shy of 50 miles an hour, but it zips away at about the same haste as a 125cc petrol power bike. With just one battery, the range is claimed at 40 miles, with a charge time of over four hours. But with two batteries, obviously, that's double. While Maving are British, the hub-mounted electric motor has been built by Bosch, while the battery is supplied by Samsung. It's 5,990, that's the dual battery option, um, and it's placed, uh, the RM1 is placed just above the lower end of the electric market, yeah. But I think of all the cheaper electric bikes I've seen, the Maving is by far the most unusual and the best built. It is a desirable thing when you see it up close. I know it's not for everybody, the, the looks of it, but uh, it works for me, and I think, you know, if you lived in a town or city, definitely one worth considering. Alrighty, that's the first paper. Next up, another electric story. Triumph T1 hits the track. Now, this was a massive disappointment to me because this is this Triumph um, electric uh, sort of development bike that they've been teasing us with now for what seems like 18 months, two years. It looks absolutely stunning. They've said they finished it. I assumed it was going to then become a production motorcycle, but oh no, they've decided they can't make it because it's too expensive to make. A, a massive disappointment to me. Anyway, let's read what uh, MCN say. Um, Triumph have announced the end of their T1 electric motorcycle development program by producing an aggressive 175 brake horsepower sports naked capable of hitting 100 miles an hour faster than a combustion engine speed triple 1200 RS. So this thing is quick. But before you go reaching for your credit card, the T1 will never go into production. Instead, it's serving as an educational tool to allow the Hinkley firm to produce what they believe to be viable electrical motorcycles for the future. Now, it's such a shame this. 
Because when they started off this, it, to me, it sounded like it was going to be a production bike. They said they wanted something that was going to be fast to charge, um, a good range, lightweight uh, and comparable price. Well, it seemed they've got the charging, the weight and comparable performance and everything else to um, a, an internal combustion engine bike. But they haven't managed to get the price down, hence why it's not going to market. It's got a 100 mile an hour range, 170 brake horsepower equivalent, 20 minutes uh, to 80% recharge, which is amazing. Um, and it's 220 kilograms, which isn't light, but it's not super heavy, is it, like other electric bikes are. Um, it's, uh, yeah, that 20 minute recharge sounds great. Uh, anyway, what it says here, um, this is, I think it's Tim Sargent who's there. Uh, top man. He says just because the T1 is sport it won't mean, oh no, Sergeant said we already have bikes on the drawing board now that the guys are starting to, to develop. As a brand we don't make utilitarian vehicles. What we will make will be something that's a triumph. It will be an electric triumph but it won't be this. And presumably that's just because this has proven too expensive. It's such a shame because it looks absolutely amazing doesn't it? I really like that and I'm really disappointed that we got teased by it and then it was dragged away at the last minute. But there we go. I suppose we can't make it for the price. It wouldn't have sold and that would be that. Right, another bit on the Gold Star. Going for a Gold Star, it says here. The new BSA Gold Star caused a stir when it was unveiled last year, but has had a rocky route to market through the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we were so clear that we were not going to do a badging exercise, explains um, Anapan Thereja, or Thereja. Uh, he's a CEO of Classic Legends and director of BSA. Um, we came to the UK and built a team here to design the bike. I actually kept everybody in India away from it. Anapam says that he and the design team practically moved into the Motorcycle Museum in Birmingham as they spent so much time studying classic BSAs to try to capture as much authenticity as possible for the new design. And I have to say, I think they've done it. It does look like a BSA Gold Star, which is brilliant. I think they've done a top job on the styling. And again, they've listened. Uh, that bike that was at the um, NEC, we all moaned, didn't we, about the thick header pipes. And now they've, they've um, uh, changed it so that the header pipes are a bit thinner, but they've got like a heat shield on the lower part of the front. It just looks much better. Uh, the engine in the Gold Star is far from rudimentary, though and every effort has been made with partners, including Rotax, to create a smooth and balanced power unit. I love the fact it's got a Rotax engine. In terms of vibrations, most people would look at a balance factor of about 64% for a single, says Joshi. Perfect balance would be 50%, which is theoretically possible, but practically not. We're currently at 52%, which is amazing. So it's gonna be, even though I don't like big thumpers, generally speaking, this one sounds like it's gonna be smooth. BSA have made the first models in, in India where all the tooling has been made, but the hope is still to move to the Midlands in future. So yeah, I, I, I think it's gonna do really well. Again, more stories on the BSA a little bit later in bike news. Another British uh, bike manufacturer, British firm revealed Dakar style retro CCM prototype packs old school desert racer vibes. Now this looks interesting. CCM, I have a bit of a sort of a mixed thing with. I quite like the looks of the bike. I very much like the looks of the bikes. I've never liked the engine they put in it because it's a single thumper and I didn't think it, it went very well with the bikes. That's just a personal view. However, in this case, if they're going to do an off-road Dakar-like bike, then it does make sense to have a big thumpy off-road engine in it. So uh, let's see what it says here. This bike, sneakily shown at the recent Adventure Bike Rider Festival, shows that CCM are planning to continue spinning off impressively spec versions of the popular handcrafted retro roadster, the Spitfire. Referred to as the Retro Trailer, it uses the usual punchy enduro-derived liquid-cooled 600cc single-cylinder engine, producing around 56 brake horsepower, um, and it's on a crafted tubular steel frame, so the usual stuff that they do with the Spitfire there. Uh, what sets it apart over it is its big tank retro desert racer looks, which probably is just a bit of styling to cover the radiator up. Uh, in place of CCM's usual Marzocchi forks, the retro trailer has long travel inverted O-lins at the front, so top spec stuff, and old school O-lins twin shocks at the rear. Uh, CCM say they are assessing public responses to the bike, so not necessarily saying they're going to make it, but if you like the looks of this one, uh, let them know, because uh, perhaps they will do. There we go, yeah, looks good. Uh, I, um, MCN reckon by their... Um, calculations this is the 14th or 15th version of the Spitfire that CCM have now made they make them in limited runs I think it's 200 bikes something like that uh, because after that they then have to adhere to all the homologation rules uh, by making limited runs they can get around it so they have to change the model every now and then so it's not the same bike quite sneaky really the way they do that but uh, again I do like the the workmanship on the CCMs look amazing Right, next up, another um, sort of trailer adventure bike thing here, but this time it's from MV Augusta. And I have to say, I think this one looks absolutely awful. <laughs> I've got to think about some of these big trailers. I know people love the upright Dakar look, but it, it doesn't work for me. And this has got to be one of the ugliest bikes I've seen, which for MV is quite a thing, isn't it? Because usually they make beautiful bikes. It says here, MV entered the adventure bike market with a punchy 930cc trail and tarmac weapon. 
Uh, MV Augusta is set to stir things up with the booming adventure bike market with this Kagiva Elephant inspired Lucky Explorer 9.5. Not sure about these naming conventions. It's got a bike featuring a nine, sorry, it's an all new bike featuring a 931cc triple. Fully adjustable sack suspension. Uh, it's not ready yet, but MCN grabbed a ride on the prototype in Northern Italy. The engine's derived from the 800cc three-cylinder unit in the F3 Brutale Dragster and Turismo Veloce and Super Veloce. Uh, so a nice engine. I've ridden that engine a few times. It is a nice engine. The triple produces more power than Ducati's Desert 10 or Desert X, KTM's 890 Adventure, Triumph's Tiger 900 and Honda's Africa Twin. Final version will have multiple rider modes, both for on and off road and a six axis IMU. Uh, there's a generous seven inch TFT and a 20 litre fuel tank. Um, the nearest obvious competition in terms of price is Ducati's Desert X or Desert 10, not sure what the, how you're supposed to say that. That's 14,095. Uh, the MV they're expected to be about 15 grand uh, or maybe slightly more when it hits UK dealers next year. So we'll see how that one does. But be interested to see what you think of the looks of that one. Am I alone on thinking it's an ugly bike? Or is that a general view? I, I can't see that one selling myself, but I know lots of people love the looks of this type of bike, so I may be in a minority on this one. Right, last in this second paper. Um, make it a trip to remember. Now, this is an interesting article. That I just, I've highlighted a few things here. They've come up with top 10 top tips for your best riding holiday, is what they said here. Some of these you may agree or disagree with. Let me pick out a few of them. Number one, sharpen your brain game. Getting travel fit is crucial, it says here. Basically, get fit to go on a bike tour. Couldn't agree more. Um, if you're fit, you're gonna enjoy it. You're not gonna get achy. Makes a lot of sense, so yeah, get that. Stop more to go further. Stops are crucial and a way to stave off mental exhaustion. Again, couldn't agree more. I like to stop when I'm on tour probably once every hour, about every 50 miles or so. Um, again, common sense, I'm sure everybody does that. Master the limit point. To effortlessly master roads you've never seen before and keep doing it for hours, a decent pace, you need an elevated ability to read the road. I'm sure you know about um, reading uh, the limit point, so I won't, um, I won't tell you about it. Now, if you don't know about it, go and read it up. It's, there's all sorts of YouTube videos about it. Not sure I necessarily use that or not consciously all the time. Maybe after a while, um, when you've been riding for you know a few years, you do that automatically, I don't know. But I wouldn't necessarily say that it's something you, you have. is super important to master for, for touring, but, but a good technique anyway. Uh, establish a group riding system. I'd definitely say that. Um, even if, um, you know, if there's lots of you, uh, then, you know, doing that rider drop-off system or some other way uh, it would be a good idea or just at least come up with some sort of hand signal so that, you know, you know, pointing at the tank when you need fuel, that sort of thing, um, just so you've got some way of communicating. Uh, beware the first two seconds. If you're riding abroad, you face a powerful enemy, your brain. This is referring to if, for example, you pull out of a fuel station, you're not too sure where to go, you're riding on the other side of the road, often you'll go on the wrong side of the road, so absolutely agree with that lose some speed um, hone your pillion skills master mountain hairpins don't fear u-turns and don't forget to enjoy it. all great tips and a really good article uh, if you're thinking of going touring then uh, get yourself a back copy of mcn it was that one there uh, which is the uh, july the 13th edition good article that enjoyed reading it right next no new petrol bikes after 2035. The UK government have made an announcement. The government proposes early cutoff for combustion engine motorcycles. This is exactly what we didn't want, isn't it? Uh, fresh proposals have been tabled to end the sale of petrol motorcycles and scooters by 2035. A consultation will run uh, until the 21st of September this year. Uh, some categories of bike are planned to end by 2030, including learner-friendly L3E A1 motorcycles, which produce no more than 14.8 bhp, so the classic 125s. Uh, the Motorcycle Industry Association has criticised the plans, stating that L3E A1 vehicles are actually more environmentally efficient than some electric cars. So, <laughs> incredible, isn't it? Sometimes they, they don't think these things through, do they? They just want to, it seems to me, be seen to be doing the right thing. Let's face it, motorcycles are not the issue, are they, when it comes to um, pollution and so on. Um, so there we go, that is a little bit disappointing. We'll talk more about that in a minute. There's another follow-up story in the next paper, I think, on that one. Okay, radar tech for next gen tracer, tracer fresh spy shots, real radar guided cruise control, new TFT dash for Yamaha's big selling sports tour. Now, this is the um, Tracer 900G or the Tracer 9GT as it's now called. And I rode this recently, or relatively recently, and I loved it. But one of the things I didn't like was that funny split TFT screen on it. And it seems that um, Yamaha have listened uh, and, and are going to do away with that and put a new TFT on. Let me just read you some highlights here and then we'll talk more. Despite receiving a full update in 2020 to meet Euro 5, the Tracer 9 GT looks set to undergo another refresh for 2023. 
uh, with new spy shots showing a bike in the works fitted with radar cruise control and more conventional colored TFT instrument panel. That's great news. Most noticeable is a new black box located above the front 17 inch wheel, which is the, the radar box. But looking at these pictures here, I can't see on the mirrors, for example, any blind spot detectors, which for me, that radar technology is all very well for um, doing adaptive cruise control. But for me, it's the blind spot detection that's the winner. It doesn't look like this has got it. Uh, oh, it says here, that said, with no rear sensor in, in these images, it's likely that Yamaha, uh, the, the Yamaha system is a slightly more wallet-friendly offering uh, in keeping with the Tracer's affordable brand value. So they've scrapped that uh, in, in favour of just having the adaptive cruise control, which I think is an error, personally. Again, interested to hear what you think, but really good that they've done away with that, um, uh, with that rather unconventional-looking TFT. Putting a standard TFT on it just works, because it's a, it's a brilliant bike, the Tracer 9. It really is nice. Yeah, and that would make it you know that would put me off the previous tft a new one probably wouldn't right this is an interesting comparison flick the switch can electric bikes really outdo petrol when it comes to everyday riding seems mtn maybe have got it in a bit for electric bikes in this issue and I, i'm kind of with them actually uh, let me just go to the straight to the verdict here so they've compared there's an odd comparison here the triumph trident 660 against the zero srs and the first thing that strikes you here is the triumph is 7595 the zero 22240 almost three Triumph Tridents you can buy for one zero. So there's the first massive black mark against electric bikes in their current form, isn't it? So let's read the verdict from John Arry. Electric is a viable option in the four-wheeled four -wheeled world as a car is generally used as a practical and necessary tool and therefore has permission to lack that emotional connection that we have with motorbikes. An argument that also applies to small size electric scooters. Yeah, like I was saying about the Maving, for example, earlier, if you're using it as urban transport, it makes sense. But if you're doing like I, you know, as an enthusiast bikes to go touring or, or riding for 100 miles on a Sunday afternoon, it don't really work, does it? Electric bikes are fine if you want to, here we are. Electric bikes are fine if you just want to use one for commuting a set route, but so far that's about the limit of their abilities. I'd rather blow seven and a half grand on the Trident and be able to enjoy it when I want it in any way I see fit, says John. And I could not agree more. And it's great to hear them saying that because so often we hear electric bikes being, um, Almost, we're trying to be convinced that they're the way. Of, I'm sure they are in the future, but they ain't there yet, are they? And, and the companies that try and convince us otherwise are in cloud cuckoo land. I can't believe too many people are going to blow 22 grand on the Zero SRS, no matter how fast it is, uh, when you can get other bikes, um, you know, so much less that give you so much more at the moment. Electric bikes are coming, no doubt about it, particularly given that other article we just uh, read, you know, the government are forcing us down that route for new bikes. I, for one, will be keeping my old internal combustion bikes until I die. Um, so don't, I, I get a lot of comments of people say, oh gosh, oh, you know, we're, we're not gonna be able to ride internal combustion bikes. That's not the case. If you're a enthusiast, like I suggest probably most of you are, and like myself, then of course you can continue to ride your internal combustion bike after the 2030 or 2035 cutoff. The issue, of course, will be getting fuel over time come 2040 it might be that fuel stations that sell petrol are far, few and far between and it may be that uh, petrol is prohibitively expensive so it will definitely become an enthusiast niche thing but by then i won't care anyway um but yeah so, so they're not going away anywhere quickly but um they're definitely coming in the future but they, they ain't there yet i agree wholeheartedly with mcn on that one right more on the bsa so it had its um it had its first outing with some journalists and some YouTubers getting to ride it at the Millbrook Proving Ground. I did get invited to this. Unfortunately, it clashed with one of my daughter's graduations, so I couldn't go along, and I was desperate to ride this. And I've kind of pleaded with the BSA to let me have a bike to ride, because uh, I said I thought I'd get a lot of views on my channel. Uh, they, they understand that I do now have a contact in BSA, which is fantastic, but unfortunately, I just don't have any bikes to lend me. Uh, and because of various logistical factors, I ain't now going to be able to ride one realistically, probably, until at the earliest September, but more likely probably October. That's just me personally, without even BSA saying they've got a bike available. So it'll be a while before you see me riding a BSA on the channel. Sorry about that, but as soon as I can, I 100% will. This is the most exciting bike as far as I'm concerned to be released this year, how sad have I become? Right, the verdict from uh, my favourite MCN tester, Michael Neves, because he went to the uh, Millbrook uh, ride. He said, BSA have created a machine that focuses on single cylinder simplicity and riding enjoyment. Well, that's what we all want, isn't it? The Gold Star isn't the fastest or best handling retro out there, but neither is it pretending to be. Instead, it's easy to ride, solid and reassuring. It's still quick if you want it to be. It's nicely finished, detailed, and comes with a rumbling, but not too shouty classic British soundtrack. The BSA isn't an iconic badge slapped on a generic motorcycle. It's well thought out and the perfect steed for new riders or for those who just want to take it easy, which is absolutely brilliant, isn't it? And it starts at £6,500. That's the other thing that got uh, announced um, around the same time as this um, 
Millbrook Proving Ground ride went on uh, was the pricing, £6,500, so a little bit more expensive than the um, Enfield Interceptor, which I think is probably a mistake, um, because we all know that the um, Royal Enfield Interceptor 650 is a proven bike now, it's been around for uh, three years, 2019 I think I got mine, um, we know it's sound, we know it's reliable, it looks fantastic, it goes well. Uh, the BSA has got to beat it in some way. And of all the reviews I've seen of this so far, no one's saying it's stratospherically better than the, than the Royal Enfield. It's kind of on a par with it, it sounds like, um, but it's not better than necessarily, yet it's more expensive. So that may be an error, I think. I think BSA should have undercut the Royal Enfield if they could have done. But there we go. We shall see how that, uh, how that pans out long-term sales-wise, won't we? Well, are you interested in the BSA? Would you buy one at six and a half grand over a Royal Enfield Interceptor? Stick your comments below. Right, last paper before we get on to parish notices then. Record breakers, new milestone as women riders take over Hinkley. Ah, oh, yeah, this is a great story. So this was, I think, last weekend. Riders came out in force on Sunday to help break the world record for the largest all-woman bike meet. During the five-hour window, 1,549 individual female bikers rode into the car park at the Triumph Factory Visitor Experience in Hinkley, Leicestershire, to be part of the world record, a figure that smashes the previous record by 417 women. Um, the latest record of 1,549 shifts the dial significantly, uh, but an Australian event planned for sept September is focused on stealing the record back. There's a bit of rivalry here between us and the Aussies. Um, the gathering had a proper party atmosphere, live music, food vendors, trade ex exhibitors, charity raffle, which raised £9,000 for the Midlands air ambulance so that's excellent so yeah I'm, I'm all for this sort of thing i'm all for getting more women into motorcycles you've seen that uh, my missus mrs flower is learning to ride more on that in due course i keep getting asked how she's getting on so we will make another update video on how she's doing with her riding and she is still riding she's enjoying it more and more um and yeah maybe uh, if the if the aussies do beat us and there's another one of these maybe i'll get uh, mrs flower to go along it's got to be great to get more women into motorcycling isn't it and uh, it, i don't see why it has to be a male only um, pastime so this this thing is only good and encouraging isn't it it seems to me there has been a little bit of a shift some of the events i've been to uh, this year notably that bike shed show and the um abr festival way more women there that i've seen before so it's great I i'm convinced there are more women getting into it and it's only a good thing for the industry isn't it and for the rest of us who enjoy being around females let's face it okay Ruby Red is up. This is another new British bike. It's from a company I hadn't heard of before called Mac Motorcycles. And they built this rather handsome looking bike. What I like about it, number one is the shape of the tank and the tail unit, uh, but also that you can see fresh air through the frame. It implies to me that it's going to be light and agile. What I don't like about it though, is they built this bike using that same engine that's in the CCM. You remember I said the big thumpy one that's off of a, a trails bike? It may suit this bike, I don't know. Um, but I quite like the looks of this. We'll see what happens. We'll see if it comes into fruition. Let me read you what it says here. Um, Mac Motorcycles are, aimed to, are aiming to bring a production ready version of their British built Ruby Cafe Racer to this year's Motorcycle Live at the NEC in November. Uh, it's a 600cc single produced by Italian firm SWN to bring it to market. It's the same motor used in CCM's uh, Spitfire range. According to Mac, the motor produces 52 brake horsepower at the crank, is dressed in a glossy deep red, uh, and the Ruby features a 760mm seat height. So it's nice and low as well. It looks to me like it's going to be low and light. I imagine it'll be a lot of fun if only that engine's not too thumpy. Unlocking that thrapping single single cylinder soundtrack is a stainless steel exhaust built by Italian firm QD and sounds beefy but still meets current emission and noise regulations. It could be an absolute cracker, couldn't it? What do you make of that? Does it look nice? What other colours should they do? I'd like to see a dark blue one. Yeah, I think would be nice. All right, moving on. Third story. Miles for me and Dad. Ah, oh, yeah, this is a this is a great story. This is um, well. Let me read you what it says here, and then I'll talk some more. An epic three thousand five hundred mile solo ride around Britain is to be undertaken on a Suzuki Van Van One Two Five in memory of an East Sussex man's dad, and to raise money for St Wilfrid's Hospice in Eastbourne, where he spent his final days. John Coop, uh, or Coupe, depending on if you're French. Uh, 38, lost his bike-loving dad Stephen to cancer in June 2020 before they had the chance to do the motorcycle adventures John had long been dreaming of. Um, the help and support my dad received from St Wilfrid's, the hospice, uh, was so valuable I decided I would try and give something back. Um, so this is just, this is a, a sad story but also good news because I'm just, the, the work that hospices do is incredible so anything that raises money for them I'm a fan of and it so happens I know that John is a viewer uh, of the Missenden Flyer as well so well done John, sorry to hear about the loss of your dad but I hope this ride goes fantastically well and you raise lots of money. If you're interested in helping John out and raising money for the hospice then check out his Just Giving pages at justgiving.com slash fundraising slash me, myself and dad, all one word. So go to Just Giving and search for me, myself and dad uh, and you'll see um, the Just Giving page for this particular charity ride. So uh, well done, John. Best of luck with that and enjoy the ride. 
I'm sure your dad would have done as well. He'll be looking down on you. Right, next up. This is, this is great. BMW's baby race replica revealed. Now, we talked about this, I think, in the last bike news that there are rumours that BMW were going to build a small race bike for the Asian and Eastern market. Well, it looks like they have now done so. Let me read you what it says here. It looks great, this. Uh, BMW have pulled the covers off their sportiest A2 category bike so far. A fully fair G310RR single based on the existing G310R Naked and G310GS adventure bike. Uh, the RR isn't currently planned for our market, which is the downside, because I think this sort of bike is what would get new riders into motorcycling. I'm not saying it's a bike for me. It's probably quite uncomfortable, I don't know, although this guy seems to be sitting up quite well on it. But it does look really cool. It looks like a little... Um, S1000 RR, doesn't it? It looks, looks cool. Um, it does meet, however, Europe's Euro 5 emissions, meaning a global launch wouldn't be an impossibility. Maybe they're keeping their options open. Let's hope so. Although they're producing the same 34 bhp, the RR differs significantly by, by gaining four switchable riding modes, which I think is hilarious on a bike putting out 34 brake horsepower. Uh, it's also treated to a digital dash and different switch gear. In India, the new RR is priced 5.5% higher than the R, so that would put the UK price at £5,200. £5,200 for this, I think, what, what an absolute bargain. Again, compare that against the BSA or the Royal Enfield. I know they're aimed at different markets, but, um, you know, that's that's um, a quality machine at that price point. I, I think it's a, such a shame that it's not available here. I guess BMW know that it's not worth tooling up to do that. You know, the distribution fees, etc. they get, guess they're not going to sell enough, but uh, I think it might throw off the shelves. I think, you know, lightweight fun. You could thrash that around the lanes. You wouldn't use your license and it looks cool. What's not to like? Alrighty, last story on the papers then before we move to parish notices. Generation game. Yamaha's new XSR 900 takes on its retro rivals. Should you go 60s, 70s or 80s? So they're looking at the XSR 900 versus the Speed Twin, a bike I know well as I'm an owner, so I'm biased here, and the Kawasaki Z900 RS SE, a bike I also know well. I've got one parked in the garage at the moment that I'm borrowing. Uh, reviews coming up uh, in the next month on that bike. That's a bike I absolutely love as well. And for me, the Speed Twin and the Z900 RS are the best retro bikes out there. Let's see what um, MCN said we'd buy the Kawasaki. There we go. Yeah, I probably would too as well. There's no doubt Trump Speed Twin is cracking. Uh, we prefer the Yamaha XSR900 though, but we'd buy the Kawasaki Z900 RS SE. Though it hasn't the outright handling of the others, it's more than capable of exciting B-road shenanigans and its motor matches the thrust of the twin and triple whilst also being smoother. The only problem is the UK allocation has already sold out, which is true. If you look on the Kawasaki website, you can't buy um, the XSR, uh, sorry, the Z900 RS. S S E the R S you can still get and of course there are second hand versions around. Uh, the one I'm riding at the moment is just a standard R S. Brilliant bike, thoroughly enjoyed it. Been riding it a lot. I did a biker scram on it, uh, to, which was a good couple of hundred mile ride there and back um, to get to properly know the bike a bit more and to try and work out in my head whether I prefer it to the Speed Twin and overall where, if I was buying now which I go for. So watch that video for my uh, sort of full review on the sort of comparison of the two if you like. Um, anyway, they've given the Speed Twin four out of five. The uh, Kawasaki 5 out of 5 and the Yamaha 5 out of 5. I disagree with that. I haven't ridden the XSR 900, but I think it looks awful. Um, so I wouldn't even consider it on looks ground alone. I think, forget the Yamaha, although they reckon it's the best bike, so maybe I'm doing it a massive disservice. But it shows how important, doesn't it, that looks are when you're buying a bike. On the other hand, I think the Kawasaki looks the best out of all of them, and it does ride beautifully. The clocks are wonderful on it. And then, of course, the Speed Twin. I absolutely love that. I love the fact it's a Triumph. It's a proper thumper. Completely different um, uh, riding characteristic to the Kawasaki, and that's the bit where I struggle to decide which I like most, because the, the Triumph is very smooth and very talky and purrs along. It never feels like it's under stress. The Kawasaki is the opposite. It screams along, four-cylinder again, but it sounds great, and it feels a little bit lighter and more agile, so... Tricky one. Anyway, watch my other videos on that coming up soon for more details. Alrighty, talking about what's coming up, it's time for... Of course, parish notices. And you may have noticed, uh, no readers rise uh, this month. I just simply haven't had time to put it together. It's been a very busy month for me, uh, for reasons which you'll find out in a few months' time. Um, but um, I, don't worry, if you sent me in um, pictures of your bike and your stories, uh, those readers rise are coming back. I'll either do them in bike news or I might even do some standalone readers rise episodes. I don't know, so they're not wasted. But uh, yeah, sorry about that if you're looking forward to a readers rise. Anyway, parish notices, what's coming up 
on the channel in the next month. Well, on the 6th of August, I've got the long-awaited, um, my next classic review uh, of the Kawasaki GTR 1400. Now, I teased some pictures of this uh, probably six weeks ago on my Instagram page. If you're not following me on Instagram, do go and check that out because I, I, that's most up-to-date, shows you what I'm filming or what time. Um, so the Kawasaki GTR 1400 is coming up. Um, so look out for that one. Um, I, on the 10th of August, I've got another of my uh, garage talk videos. I haven't done one of these for a while. This is basically where I just take you around the garage, talk about all my bikes and the things that I've changed, what, what I'm doing with them at the moment. They seem to go down quite well. So that's coming up on the 10th of August. On the 13th is that Kawasaki Z900 RS revisited review because I'd already ridden one about three, four years ago. Uh, so this was a sort of a revisit to try and work out how I feel about it now compared to the Speed Twin having now owned that for a while. So that's coming out on the 13th of August. Then uh, I've got a little mini series coming out, me and Mrs. Fly on tour. And I thoroughly recommend this one to you because it looks like it's going to be a flying video, ends up being a biking series. So that's on the 17th, 20th and 21st of August. Look out for it. It's called When Flying Goes Bad. I'll, I'll say no more. We had a little issue, let's just say that. Anyway, it's well worth watching. First episode is basically a flying video, which lots of you have been asking for, so I'm, I'm quite happy to put that up. Then it goes from flying to biking, and then it's a tour video for the final one. So, so look out for that. I really enjoyed making this, as it turns out, even though it started off somewhat disappointing, as you'll see. But look out for that in the middle of the month. Uh, 27th, I've got the MV Augusta F3 review. Thanks to my pals down at Crazy Horse. What an incredible bike that's coming up. Uh, and again, a long-awaited, much overdue biker scram coming up last day of August the 31st. We went to what turns out to be called Jilks. We thought it was called Gilks. But down in Warwickshire, myself, Jeff and Dan last week took the bikes down there uh, and uh, to check out Jilks. Lots of you again had asked us to go there, so watch that on the 31st of August. I think you'll enjoy that one. Uh, and then the next bike news like this coming up on the 3rd of September. And I would recommend you watch that one because I'm going to be giving you some uh, very big news about changes coming to the channel. As, uh, I'm basically shaking things up a bit, but I'll tell you all about that um, on the next bike news on the 3rd of September. So as always, thank you to my patrons and to my sponsors for keeping everything running at the Mist and Fly. I couldn't do it without you guys. And of course, thank you to you too for watching. I certainly couldn't do it without you watching at the channel. So uh, that's it for this time. Look forward to speaking to you again soon. Don't forget, comment below, subscribe, follow me on social media, all that sort of thing. And uh, oh, do check out the website if you fancy some TMF merch, www.themissandfly.com. All right, speak to you again soon. Until next time, this has been The Mist and Fly. Cheerio.